The President, please be seated. The court is now back in session. I wish to ask the expert. Just now, there was interruption in the interpretation because we know that uh, you are well conversed with both languages, English and French. And now the question being put to you is in French. According to in the information I have received, you can actually respond uh, back in French. So uh, for this reason, I ask uh, the interpreting team uh, to be prepared accordingly so that the proceeding of uh, examination is going smoothly. Oui, monsieur, merci. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. The President, so I interpreters are instructed to uh, change the channel uh, accordingly. Now question and answer will be in French. You may proceed, uh, Judge. Thank you, President, and thank you, Mr. Expert, for responding in French. I also gather that when you are being asked questions in English, that you uh, are at liberty to revert to English. Let us return to the matter of the policy of collectivization and the establishment of cooperatives. Is it accurate to say that the policy had uh, been developed as of May 1973 and that there had been some practical considerations that had been considered according to which the supply of rice had to be controlled by the revolutionary forces, which would have then prevented uh, the Vietnamese forces from disturbing the production and supply of rice. Is this accurate? Answer, yes, I do think it is accurate. There were two reasons for that. Firstly, there was an interest to organize the uh, production and supply of rice in order to prevent the Vietnamese from causing disorder. But it was also to preclude any chaos later on. Judge Laverne, so in effect, there was an ideological consideration uh, or interest to build a pure and honest society uh, based on the words that were used at the time. And in essence, in the eyes of uh, the leaders, private trade and private property uh, ownership uh, were sullied or dishonest undertakings. And here I want to refer to a passage in order to justify the implementation of this policy. Pol Pot uh, would uh, distort the reality by making sure that three-fourths of the population lived in uh, Kazi indigence. As of 1973, the policy of uh, establishing cooperatives by the Khmer Rouge was based on quasi famine. Uh, the majority of Cambodians would suffer from famine during the regime. Cooperatives therefore represented progress to the extent that the majority of Cambodians uh, were happy and devoted to the new collective system as Paul put it. Dissent was ipso facto, the mark of a class enemy. Like many of the policies he imposed, it was a case of Pol Pot, as it were, cutting the feet to fit the shoes. 
Do you confirm what I have just read out, and do you wish to provide any further explanation? Answer, I do confirm that. There is a quote that I would like to share. It wasn't just a matter of cutting the feet to fit the shoes. But my man, who was a student in Paris, alongside Pol Pot, and who was also in Cambodia during the revolution, said that all men and all women were to only be uh, one meter and 60 centimeters tall. Uh, it fell into the same line of thinking. Everyone living under the democratic uh, Cambodia regime had to fit a certain mold. And there is a contradiction in that because Pol Pot knew very well that 79% uh, of people living in uh, total shortfalls wasn't true. And for all those who didn't want to become members of the Communist Party, he only accepted peasants or uh, middle class peasants. And as for the uh, slightly richer peasants or anyone belonging to any higher echelon, uh, was denied entry into the party. And he employed other methods. We're not talking about 75%. Uh, we're talking about a rather small minority that lived in uh, what would be considered quasi-absolute poverty. Judge Laverne, so those who belonged to a particular class would be certain of being uh, uh, of agreeing to the policies being implemented? Answer, exactly. And poverty was not corrupt, corrupted by material goods. Judge Laverne, and with respect to poverty and what the Khmer Rouge considered ownership and the policy of collectivization, I wish now to refer to another document. This is the revolutionary flag, the August 1975 issue, E3 slash 5, ERN in Khmer, are the following, 00, 35, 75, 56, to 75, 97 in French, 00, 53, 89, 53, to 62. And in English, the ERNs are 004077 to This is an article entitled Cadres, Members of the Party, the Population and Revolutionary Army must agree with the party to review and assess the situation as well as review uh, the tasks required for the great leap forward. It refers to 1973 as the date uh, at which the absolute democratic revolution uh, was to begin. There is mention of the collectivization of land and the prohibition of private property, ownership and property. Uh, return to the bartering system. And as for merchants, they have been ordered to 
uh, exert liberal manual labor uh, like everyone else. And as for private ownership and property, at French ERN 0058961, if we look at Phnom Penh, so-called private property can be powerful in the countryside, however. Uh, private ownership dominates in Phnom Penh. However, we cannot uh, allow this. Uh, property and ownership must have no power. I believe this morning you testified that collectivization had been used as a reason by Pol Pot as one pretext for the evacuation of cities and of Phnom Penh. So therefore, is what I just read out something which uh, is consistent with your uh, analysis or something that emerged later on? Answer, I'm not entirely sure I understand what emerged later on. Was the ideological reason behind the reason to evacuate the cities or did the ideological reason uh, crop up afterwards in order to justify the evacuation? Answer, it was used beforehand, and uh, that ideological reason was highly significant in my mind. Uh, let's think of China, where the countryside encircled cities, whereas in the Cambodian Revolution, the countryside was much purer, much cleaner, as you said. However, it was a way to evacuate all of the corruption that festered in the cities. And there was a time before 1973 when Pol Pot had come to the realization that trade in uh, small cities of the countryside and small townships of the countryside was resuming and he wanted to eradicate this. Therefore, it was one of the triggers of the radicalization that had uh, begun to take shape in 1973, Judge Laverne. And so the radicalization had begun before 1973, and did it start to uh, emerge and manifest with the abolition of currency? Was the abolition of money and currency uh, a result of that. Answer, there were two stages. After 1973, there was a system of bartering that began to prevail in the countryside. However, at the time, uh, there was not a very prevalent use of uh, the currency used during the Lanol regime. And that is why, at the same time, in the liberated zones, the Lanol regime money was no longer used. And Peking was uh, requested to print revolutionary money. And in 1974, it had been decided that only revolutionary currency would be used in democratic Kampuchea. Later on, after April 1975, whatever uh, reserves remained at the uh, central bank was destroyed. However, they did attempt to uh, establish a system of, of a very specific system of 
currency. And then in 1975, there was a policy to no longer allow a currency to be circulated and not to uh, use it, because as Tamok said, the wound had not uh, uh, been healed. He had to uh, stem the bleeding. That was his own expression. And so, therefore, it was their decision to uh, go down that path. And I believe that it is a crucial turning point because at some point in time, there was no longer any uh, point of return on even the most minor details. And it is a symbol of the system of enslavement that I describe in my book. Judge Novell, are you certain that the decision to not uh, and to no longer use money was only taken after the 17th of April or had it not been decided upon earlier? I am certain, as says Mr. Witness, because Pit Chang, who served after uh, the ambassador, the DK ambassador in China, talked about the distribution of the currency. There were also people who witnessed and who attested to the fact that in their cooperatives, they were being shown what would be uh, the new money of the revolutionary regime. So for several months ongoing, there was a process to institute and circulate this new currency. Judge Lavelle, and with respect to the development of the policy of collectivization, would the uh, establishment of cooperatives also foster the elimination of the enemy? Would this uh, also be a way of determining uh, much more easily who was in agreement or not with the regime? Answer, yes. Was it a primary cause or was it simply collateral damage that spun off from the policy of collectivization? It's true, yes, indeed, it had facilitated the task. I have a much broader question before moving to another topic. Generally speaking, and based on what is written in your book, do you still agree and stand by what you wrote in your book? Or there are certain passages in your book uh, uh, relative to which, uh, with the hindsight and wisdom of uh, uh, time, that you would look upon a bit differently or modify? Answer, I have reread my book. There are a few repetitions in the book that I would have uh, uh, taken out for stylistic reasons, but there's nothing that strikes me uh, or nothing that would compel me to say, why did I say that? I still stand by what I wrote and believe that it is correct. Judge Leven, thank you. Let's move into another realm concerning the role of Mr. Kyo Son Pong. Now, it would appear that following the uh, fall of uh, Prince Sihanouk, as of March 1970, a letter was written by the, uh, to the front and signed by Kyu Sonpan, Hu Yun, and Hu Nim. You describe that the letter was supposedly written by Pol Pot, who at the time would have resided 
in Peking. Can you please confirm that? And possibly provide some more ample explanations. Answer, he wasn't in Peking. He was just uh, uh, traveling through when Sihanouk uh, uh, fell out of power. He just happened to be there. Pol Pot, that is. In material terms, it was impossible for such a letter to be sent so quickly to Pékin. So if you want, it's a hip hypothesis. I wasn't uh, given any affirmation that Pol Pot, Pol Pot had authored the letter. Now, it's the only plausible possibility was that it was Pol Pot or someone from his entourage, but it was written in such a skillful manner in order not to arouse any concerns or uh, cause any fears that had all of the hallmarks of a Pol Pot. And shortly after the sending of the letters, there was the formation of the Grunk, the royal government of the Union uh, of Cambodia. And Mr. Kyu Sampan is uh, presented as the vice uh, prime minister and the commander in chief of the uh, armed forces, the popular armed forces of uh, uh, revolutionary Kampuchea. Do you know when exactly Mr. Kyu Sampan, following the coup d'etat, when he, when Mr. Kyu Sampan could have met Pol Pot, and when? Could Mr. Kyu Sampan have met King Sihanouk? Do you have any idea? Answer. To the best of my memory, to the best of my knowledge, I believe that when Pol Pot uh, settled in Kompong Tom, that is, he was no longer in Khatanakiri, he moved uh, to the central area of the country and set up a new headquarters of the Com Communist Party of Kampuchea near Kampong Tom. Kyu Sompon and the others had traveled uh, from the uh, Ural Mountains where they were based, and it was only then that Kyu Sompon and Pol, Pat, Pol Pot came into contact with one another. As for Kyu Sompon and King Sihanouk, I'll have to check and go into my documents, but I do believe that they met in Peking before the prince uh, visited the liberated zones of Cambodia. But the two, Kyu Sompon and the prince Sihanouk, had very little contact. Ying Sari was the CPK representative in Peking, and it was essentially through Ying Sari that uh, communications were sent. And uh, the delegation in Paris had uh, rallied around Sihanouk after his fall. Now, perhaps the defense from Kyu Sompon will uh, provide us some more specific details, but I'm not entirely sure that there was even a meeting in Peking between Mr. Kyu Sompon and King Sihanouk uh, before he returned in 1974. Perhaps we are mistaken, but I am sure that the Kyu Sompon defense will uh, provide us the uh, correct clarifications. Now, when the Grunk was uh, formed, at any point in time, was Mr. Kyu Sompon consulted? And if you simply do not know, just state so.
Uh, sir, I don't believe that Mr. Kyusampan was consulted. I don't believe that his uh, personal opinion was actually elicited. I don't believe this. Pol Pot was in Peking at the time. Ms. Yanuk was there. Uh, Tion Mum was there, as well as other members of the party. And it was the discussion was restricted amongst themselves. Because we're talking about... Uh, uh, essential and significant decisions when a man is appointed prime minister of uh, a country. It is a landmark moment. And Prince Yanuk would have accepted a role even if it were to serve as a bridge between the front and the Khmer Rouge. But how would that actually play out? What form would that actually take? This morning, I told you that Mr. Kyo Sompon was devoted and devoted wholeheartedly to the cause. I believe that Kyo Sompon believed entirely that uh, he would carry out his duties. As for the front and everything else, it would have played out later on. Kyo Son was in Kompong Tom, and any communication with uh, Sihanouk would have gone through Ying Sahi, would have gone through the Chinese, but it would have gone through Ying Sahi. And apparently there was uh, quite a bit of friction between the two. Kyo Son Pong's role only coalesced afterwards. So you're stating, if I understand correctly, Pol Pot had decided to appoint Kyo Son Pong to this very strategic position as vice prime minister because he knew that Kyo Son Pong was a loyal man devoted to the cause and that he would abide by his decision. Is this what I am to understand? It was not a strategic position. It was window dressing. He held the flag, Judge Leven, but to carry the flag uh, carries out a strategic purpose for the public. Uh, it's important to be able to identify references uh, that they can uh, identify as symbols of peace and unification. It's an image. It's an image that has uh, strategic interests. On yes, on the image, I agree. That had strategic importance. But talking about influence and leadership, no, not at all. Question. As you see it, did Kyosampong accept to be purely an image, or did he in fact want to have the decision-making powers? Response, that's a crucial question. But the answer may not match the question. I would tend to say, but this is really just an assumption based on what I believe I have understood of Mr. Kyosampan's character, that he preferred to 
be in a secondary position rather than the one in charge. And that is why he was so useful to Pol Pot and to the regime. He was somebody who was very reliable, who didn't ask questions, and who acted in the required way. Question. Thank you. Thank you for those answers. I'd now like to turn to another subject because we are short of time here. I want to ask you about possible links between the Khmer Rouge and the People's Republic of China. You are, in fact, an expert on Pol Pot and also on the history of China. So I'd like to ask you, do you remember the dates when Pol Pot first went to stay in China? Response, it was at the end of 1965, the start of 1966. I can't give you the precise dates from the top of my head, but he didn't stay very long. We're talking about one month or six weeks. And what does need to be stressed is that it was a great deal before the start of the Cultural Revolution. So he had no experience of that period. Question. 1965-1966, that is when we can say that Vietnamese oversight, so to speak, of Cambodia was still pretty strong, so to get to China he must have gone through Vietnam, is that correct? Response, that's absolutely true, he wanted to go to China and he also wanted to go to North Korea. The Vietnamese had said, no, North Korea is out of bounds, but they accepted to take him to China. Question. Now, this may be a bit complicated because we're talking about a secret visit here, but do we know anything about the people he might have met? In the Chinese Communist Party, do we know who was dealing with relations with other foreign communist parties, for example? Well, we know that he met Bot John, who was a member of the Chinese Political Bureau, who was the mayor of Peking, and who was removed from the picture during the Cultural Revolution. It's not entirely clear if he met Kang Chong, who was the big chief when it came to all kinds of external relations. He also met the foreign minister, I think, at the time. That we do know. We also know that he was housed at the institute, which was uh, designed for revolutionaries from other continents, Africa, South America, and so forth. But it was only an initial meeting, and I rather doubt that he was maneuvering with any kind of wide-scale knowledge of China. Question. You've just quoted the name of Kang Chen, a significant name, I think, in the history of China. It seems that at the time Kong Chen was in charge of relations with foreign communist parties. But can you tell us a little bit more about who Kong Chen was and why the meeting with Pol Pot could have been rather important? Kong Chen, response. Kong Chen was a member of the Standing Committee of the Political Bureau. He was a very powerful man who wielded considerable influence. He had been 
trained in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. He was alongside Mao and he did his dirty work for him. He was head of the special services. He was a formidable individual. If Pol Pot hadn't, didn't meet Kong Chen himself, and it's quite probable that he didn't, he certainly would have met people from his entourage. And I think probably that was the most significant side of the whole visit, because afterwards, in China, who was supporting Pol Pot and the Cambodian Revolution? Well, it was these protégés of Kong Chon, the deputy Chinese prime minister, the people that later on were called the Gang of Four, the ultra-radicals, in other words. And you can quite easily situate the start of that friendship with the most radical elements within the Chinese regime uh, in terms of that 1965-66 visit question. So Pol Pot was in Peking in 1970, that we know. Between 66 and 70, did Pol Pot go back to Peking? No. Response, no. From all the knowledge available, no. He didn't go abroad between those two visits. Question. In your book, there's a footnote that caught my eye. It refers to information that you might have heard from the mouth of Yang Sari when you interviewed him. And apparently Yang Sari told you that in 1970, Pol Pot had frequent contacts with Kong Chen. Can you confirm that you heard that Yang Sari told you that? And when he did, what did that make you think? Yes, I do confirm that. There's no doubt at all that they met in 1970. I heard about this uh, as well from the Chinese side, and I didn't mention this in the book, but Yang Sari was absolutely clear on the subject. I think you can probably situate it at the start of uh, 1970 in the Kong Chang entourage. Question. The footnote I'm referring to is number 200. The English ERN is 0036704, and it's page 259 of the book in French. ERN 0063714. If we can stay with Kong Chen one moment more, you include a FIBIS broadcast summary from Phnom Penh Domestic Service on E3 stroke 1356. The English ERN is 0016-7593 and in French 0070-0106. And we're looking at a broadcast concerning condolences to the People's Republic of China following the death of Kong Chen. It's from the 24th of December 1975. And 
The Chinese embassy at this moment received the Prime Minister Pen Nut, the Deputy Prime Ministers, including Kyo Sampong and Yang Sari, who go to the Embassy of the People's Republic of China in Phnom Penh to express their condolences on the occasion of the death of Gong Chen, Deputy Prime Minister of the Chinese Communist Party. He died uh, at the age of 77. The uh, Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Ministers uh, laid a wreath which had the following inscription, sincere and deepest condolences for the sad death of uh, His Excellency Kong Chen, a Chinese revolutionary individual of exceptional quality and a companion in arms close to the Cambodian people. So one can only assume that there was a certain amount of influence there. In your view, because you talked to us about those who would eventually become what was called the Gang of Four, does the name Zong Chung Kiao mean something to you? Jiang Chung Chao. Response Jiang Chung Chao was Deputy Prime Minister and probably the most influential of the ultra-radicals. He had Kang Chong's protection and the initial secret visit was made by him to Democratic Kampuchea. Now you're going to ask me when, but I can't remember. It's in my book, maybe the spring of 75 or 76, but this was the first major visit by a Chinese leader. There are photographs. He went to Angkor Wat with Pol Pot and Yang Sari and the Chinese delegation. Chang Chung Chao was somebody who was hugely important in the connection between the two countries and when he lost his position and was arrested there was consternation in Phnom Penh question so there was an official visit with photographs and somebody also reported on a secret visit which took place after the 7th of April 1975 and that was Kengek Il Doik who said that he received uh, confidential information from a Chinese teacher who he met in Beijing who told him that Chang Chung Chao had secretly come after the 17th of April 1975 to Democratic Kampuchea. His document E3-441 and the English era and is 0026-5559. And I'm sorry to say I haven't got the Khmer ERN. This information is not in fact corroborated by others, but did you ever hear about this secret visit? I believe, says the expert, that there may be a mistake here. It's very difficult to date the Zhang Zhongzhou visit. It was secret. The photos were not published at the time, and it wasn't broadcast or announced either in China or on the radio in Phnom Penh. But I would situate the visit around or in April 1976. I had a source in Peking in the Chinese party who actually told me that Chang Chung Chao had to get back to Peking by the end of April. And 
that would locate the visit in the first half of April 1976. There are other testimonies that are not terribly precise either. At B1 in the Foreign Ministry, for example, they prepared banners, placards to welcome the dignitary. But sources say that that was more at the end of 1975, but I think people are mixing the date, and I believe that it was April 76. Question. Well, whatever the case, he came at least once and he met a certain number of important people here. Let's come back to the crucial year of 1975 and to the meetings that were held between the Chinese leaders and those of the Khmer Rouge Revolution. Start with Yang Sali. In your book, you told us that before he came back to Cambodia, Yang Sali went to Pekin. Can you tell us if there was a particular reason for him to transit through Peking and what the purpose and result was? I need to check. I don't have the answer in my mind at the moment. Maybe you can give me a little bit of guidance. Judge Laverne, at the time, were there perhaps plans to obtain significant aid, particularly military, perhaps so that the assistants would not have to go through Vietnam, but go directly uh, through the Compong Song port? Response, that's absolutely true. But again, the calendar is somewhat complicated. Yang Seri went to Peking, and then he came back with a man called Kang Chu Un, who was the deputy leader of the International Relations Department of the Chinese Communist Party. And that was about a week after the 17th of April. It was the first plane to Phnom Penh from Peking. And straight away, talks got underway. And the subject, and the talks ended in Peking when uh, Pol Pot met Mao. But it was very important to have detailed discussions on Chinese aid for Cambodia. But that was happening in the autumn of 1975. Question. So you situate the meeting between Pol Pot and Mao to, as you say, talk in detail about the scope of Chinese aid to Cambodia. You situate this in September 1975. In my notes, I see reference to a visit in May or even June 75. Response, June 75, you're right. The meeting with Mao was to talk big philosophical and ideological issues. The details were worked out with Tang Xiaoping, who at the time was deputy president of the Chinese party and who was going to become Mao's successor, except that he too was destitute for a period. Question. Other important meetings took place during this period. There were meetings between Mao Zedong and Chuen Lai involving King Sihanouk and Kyo Sompong. 
In August 1975, we know that Sihanouk is in Peking and Kyo Sampan went as well to meet up with the king and perhaps convince him to come back. But what can you tell us about these meetings? You have whetted our appetite because you have referred to minutes of meetings that may have taken place and are apparently held in the central archives in Beijing, but uh, it's very hard for us to have access to them. And we would have very much liked to have had those documents. Response. It's not only incredibly difficult for you, it's pretty hard for me too. I didn't really have access to those documents. I was able to talk to Chinese officials who had seen the documents. Conversation with Chuen Lai, we know very little about what happened at that instance. We know a little bit more about the meeting that took place with Kyo Sampan, Yang Sari, and Mao. And Mao asked them to give Sianuk and Pennut decent treatment and not send them off into the paddy fields. And Kyusampong promised that they would be given proper treatment and all the honors that were due to them once they were back in Cambodia. But there was a significant moment of hesitation before Prince Yanuk came back to Cambodia. Question. So can you say that among the Chinese leadership there was a whole current of opinion in favor of moderation and trying to push that idea with the Khmer Rouge leaders and on the other side those who were more ultra Maoist and were in favor of the way the revolution was being put into effect by the Khmer Rouge. Response, that's absolutely true. Chuan Lai himself was worried about what was going to happen in Cambodia and who said, who told Kyu Song Pong that they should absolutely not emulate the Great Leap Forward in China. They couldn't say it uh, in so many words, but he had understood that it was a major disaster, and he was arguing in favor of moderation, without success, of course. It was a time when the Khmer Rouge were steeped in hubris and arrogance. They had won a victory, and they didn't want to listen to the voices of moderation. When Mao met Pol Pot, the meeting was highly instructive. He made all kinds of references, underwriting his speech to say, open up, don't stay too rigid. You're going to put your own revolution into effect, but this can't be done in isolation. So I think Mao was very impressed what the Khmer Rouge had achieved, but he too was, was worried and disturbed. Question. Can we say that as these leaders saw it, the fact that King Sihanouk was back in Phnom Penh could have lent a little moderation to the revolution. Do you see that as having been one of the hopes of the Chinese leaders in an attempt to calm things down? And that was why they were asking Sihanouk to be brought back with all due dignity and respect. Response. It's a difficult question. I'm not sure we know what they were thinking. I think the Chinese leaders were too lucid to think that a 
Sihanouk could have had a big influence on the behavior of the Khmer Rouge, but the very fact that he was in Phnom Penh, that he was head of state, did give a slightly different image to the regime. The Chinese are very practical people. I don't think that they would have believed that there could have been a real change in the regime's policy due to the presence of Sihanouk question. At that time, we heard much talk of uh, independent sovereignty and self-reliance, and it seems that the Khmer Rouge leaders wanted to defend their own independence in an extremely resolute way. Now, can we talk about independence being defended, including vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese? Response, yes. They didn't want to be the tools of the Chinese. It was a much smaller problem than vis-à-vis -vis the Vietnamese, but they wanted their own proper existence alongside the Chinese. But they didn't want to be the creatures of the Chinese. But can I come back a little bit to the matter of the prince? Another reason, without any doubt, why China wanted Sihanouk to return was that if he stayed outside of the Khmer Rouge, he would have had much less opportunity to play a significant role at a later stage. So he had to be implicated in the political system if he was going to uh, retain his hopes for the future. Question, it seems as if the assistance provided by China was significant. I don't know if we can talk about unconditional because there were ups and downs in this relationship between China and democratic Cambodia. But nevertheless, there was technical assistance, military assistance, economic aid, including to develop a banking system so that products could be exported. But at any particular time, was there a request for food aid from the Khmer Rouge leadership in the direction of China? Park Sash. Not to my knowledge. Question. Let's move to another personality who may have played a significant role. I'm talking about a gentleman called Cheng Wung Gui, who is also known as the leader of the Tachai Commune and Brigade. Earlier, I made mention of Pil Pot's visit in 1976 in China, uh, where you were working. Uh, and it would appear that Pol Pot met with that personality and began cultivating relations. Can you please uh, tell us some more about that? Yes, Cheng Wung Gui was a model peasant. He received great assistance from the Chinese state in order to build his commune and showcase it as the model commune. commune. It was all fiction, but it was the case, and he was allied with uh, radicals uh, of the extreme left, such as Chung Gao. And there was a 15-day visit to Cambodia, and he spoke uh, uh, effusively of the regime at the time. However, it wasn't a person who held any real importance. He was simply 
a symbol of Chinese agriculture. And uh, yes, he was cited, uh, and the relations were uh, tied, but with no real effect. Question. In the commune of Datsai, it was a model based in China, but it is a model that was discussed extensively during democratic Kampuchea. So what kind of role did that particular model play in the structuring and establishment of cooperatives in Cambodia? Do you have any knowledge about that, and what can you tell us? There you are entirely right. For the Cambodians, uh, the whole issue was of great importance. The commune and uh, the figure was used as an example as a successful farming and in theory it was the case but in practice no everything was already taking place and after the arrival of Ching Wen Gui, nothing really changed he came he uh, admired uh, the landscape he looked around he, they were very friendly with one another and he uh, paid compliments question uh, what can you tell us about uh, how he spoke of uh, the Cambodian accomplishments yes it's precisely that he just spoke well uh, of it and paid compliments Judge Laverne we talked about the re cultural revolution. Can you please refer us to particular documents about the cultural revolution? Was it a phenomenon that could have influenced the leaders of democratic Kampuchea and provided them guidance? And the, what about the, and the Gang of Four and uh, the death of Mao Zedong. Yes, to my knowledge, there is one document that does make mention of the Cultural Revolution. It is a message sent to the Central Committee from Pol Pot to the Chinese. It's a series of um, praises for the cultural revolution. But for the Chinese, uh, the cultural revolution was perhaps the most uh, wonderful uh, phenomenon in all of history. It uh, was rhetoric. Question. Allow me to shift to another line of uh, questions with respect to the sources you cite. You talk about letters that you may have found uh, in electronic form and that have since been conveyed to all the parties. I'll simply call them Uh, letters from the Vietnamese archives, uh, as this is the case, they are documents that you obtained and that you believed were held in the Vietnamese archives. Can you please walk us through how uh, you obtained the documents, if they were original Khmer documents or had they already been translated into Vietnamese? What can you tell us about those documents? All of those documents were obtained by an American researcher called Christopher Gosher, who was working on his doctoral thesis at the Université de Paris. His thesis was on the Khmer Rouge period, uh, the Khmer Rouge before 1975. He worked in the military library 
of Vietnam while he was researching the subject. Of the documents, there are some that were translated from Khmer into Vietnamese. They originate from the Communist Party of Kampuchea. Uh, this is the case for the, ma but the majority of documents, rather, are Vietnamese reports. Uh, some of them rather uh, lengthy reports on the Cambodian situation between 1949 and 1950 and 67. And of the military Vietnamese reports, or rather of the uh, Vietnamese reports, they contain uh, citations and references to Cambodian documents to which we do not have access. And so between the two, there's a rather interesting uh, link. They are not necessarily complete, but they do portray an interesting relationship between the two parties, and uh, they certainly illustrate uh, the point of view of the Vietnamese with respect to the Cambodian Communist Revolution. Judge Leverne, we can, of course, return to those documents if the parties so wish. I have here before me two documents that are worthy of interest. They are YTLM75. Y, y, it is a letter that you, sir, had uh, referred to uh, earlier. It dates back to 1967, addressed to the Chinese Communist Party and the start of the Cultural Revolution. And it talks about how all of the criteria in Cambodia are now met for the fomenting of a proper revolution. There's another document, KK 60, 76, rather, and this is a document emanating from the Communist Party of Kampuchea. I regret, however, that we do not have time to go into detail with those documents. I do have one final question on a document concerning In Sopip, the document entitled Keo uh, Sampan enlarged and real. And uh, my earlier question uh, as to whether or not this is indeed the same document that you had referred to in your book. Answer Yes, this is indeed one and the same document. And very briefly, Mr. Witness, can you please tell us who In So Peep is, if you recall? Did you meet the gentleman? Did you interview him? Can you please tell the chamber uh, anything about this particular document? Response, in so peep, I'm not sure if the case uh, still is relevant, but was in Pai Lin, and if I'm not mistaken, his brother was a physician, and his mother, Madame In, were all uh, loyal partisans of the Cambodian Revolution, and I did interview him several times, and he was the one who handed me this document. I found it very interesting. Namely, uh, the start of the document on the life of Kyo Sampan, and I do make reference to it several times. So you are telling us that you received this document directly from Mr. In So Peep. And uh, you cannot authenticate uh, what he relates in that particular document. Is that correct? Answer, that is correct. Judge Ravel, I believe that document can be uh, admitted into the proceedings. Mr. President, I wish to thank you uh, very much for the time that has been allocated to me for questions, and I wish to Thank you, Mr. Wh uh, Mr. Expert. President, uh, thank you, Judge LaVange, and thank you, Mr. Expert. Today's proceeding has come to an end. We will adjourn today's proceeding now.
and we'll resume tomorrow, that is Tuesday, the 7th of May 2013, commencing from 9 a.m. Tomorrow we will continue to hear the testimony of the expert Philip Short, who will be first questioned by the prosecution and followed by the lead co-lawyers. Mr. Short, the hearing of your st testimony has not yet concluded, and we will continue to hear your testimony tomorrow. For that reason, you are required to attend tomorrow's proceeding commencing from 9 a.m. Court officer, in collaboration with the VSU unit, please assist the expert Mr. Short returned to his residence and have him return to this courtroom tomorrow at 9 a.m. Security guards, you are instructed to take the two accused, that is Kiel Sampon and Nun Chi, back to the detention facility and have them return to the courtroom tomorrow prior to 9 a.m. As for Mr. Nun Chi, please bring him to the holding cell downstairs, which has been equipped with the facilities so that he can follow the proceeding through a remote means. The court is now adjourned.